one o'clock, so welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm gonna to do a very brief intro to Adobe Connect for any folks who are new, and then I will hand off to get this started. So I'm gonna end these polls and go over to make our slides larger. All right, so welcome. So one thing I just wanna point out, if you're using Google Chrome, uh, you might get some audio issues. So if that happens, we recommend logging out and logging back in with any other browser. And to log out, we get this question a lot, just close your browser and that will log you out. We really would love to see your chat um, conversation, your questions, your comments. There's folks here with experience who uh, we'd love to hear what those experiences are. Um, and people here are here to share ideas as well. So please feel free to make this very interactive. If it's helpful for you to change your chat size, you can do that by going to the upper right of the chat pod and you can change the chat size to whatever size works for you. And conversely, if the chat bothers you, you can just cover it up and we'll say out loud anything that's essential for you to know. So if uh, you'd rather not read the chat, feel free to not read the chat. Um, so to download the handouts, you can see um, over here on the left, you can click on the file name and then click on download file. So we've got telehealth handout and slides telehealth, and then you can download the file there. Uh, when we ask polls, the way to respond is to either type, so you can type here and then click submit, or if it's multiple choice, you can just click on one of the choices, or if it's multiple answer, you can click on as many as apply. And you'll know that your answer submitted because it'll say answer submitted, or you'll see some kind of change in the circles or the boxes. And just a final note, um, online it can be, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit tempting to say the first thing that comes to mind, but um, let's try to be very civil and respectful and have a great conversation today together. All right, so with that, I'd like to invite up Mary Leia Cox Awanahara, who's our Director of Marketing and Communications here at the School of Social Work. And I will hand off to Mary Leia. So she's going to, ah, she might not be ready. Okay, I'm just getting an emergency alert. That is okay. So then I will introduce Professor Amelia Ortega, who's one of our alums and who teaches uh, both, she's taught residentially and she also teaches online here at Columbia School of Social Work. And you can see her website is right here for her psychotherapy services. So Amelia, if you'd like to come up, we can um, start off by showing your video. Great, thanks Nakia for the generous welcome. Hi everyone, it's great to be here with you. All right, so let's take a look at your video. Telehealth is using technology to facilitate medicine. Most health professions are using telehealth in some way. So how did I get involved in telemedicine or telehealth, telebehavioral health? I had a number of clients in my private practice who started having big life transitions, like having children, going away to college, having some increased symptoms maybe of anxiety based on current events. And we opened this option because in New York State, many of the Medicaid HMOs and public health insurances recognized telehealth um, services as billable services. I was able to start to try out using HIPAA compliant video services to meet some clients needs who weren't able to travel to the office. So clients that really were excited about it, we got to talk about what, what about it was working for them. And so I have a child at home breastfeeding or I, um, my partner works full time and I have to do child care I mean, at night. Um, no, you know, I don't I have mind. A I diagnosis just need... And truthfully, it's, it's a better match for me to be here at home. And so a lot of these things were being said by clients and the outcomes were really positive. Why is telebehavioral health maybe becoming more utilized? I think technology is more accessible to certain communities. Many of us are working multiple jobs. 
taking the hour to commute to an appointment, spend the hour there and an hour to commute back when you have multiple jobs is no longer feasible. I work with a very low income client base. I've had clients do a online HIPAA compliant call rather than come to the office because that week, $5 to get to and from an appointment was a really significant hit on their income. I'm interested in training and consulting and also, you know, I am really interested in actually continuing to work with rural LGBTQ folks, so folks who are really disconnected. There's problems with using technology too, but I think that it's serving a really important purpose for historically marginalized communities who are having access to more now. Well, it looks like we've got Maria up here, so I will sign off and hand off. Uh, yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, sorry about my technical glitches, because um, I really wanted to introduce you and talk about how dynamic you are and what a dynamo <laughs> you are. Um, and yeah, I um, met uh, Amelia several months ago when we made that video, and she is such a great example of someone who's doing so many different things with her MSW and an inspiration to us all. And having watched that video, I have a few questions for you, Amelia, if that's OK. Um, oh. One is that I know when we first started talking, you mentioned that you would have used telehealth services you know, when you were younger. And we didn't fit that into the video, so I wondered if you could just say something about that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I grew up in a small town and in a state where there was only one um, LGBTQ youth program for the state in the state of Rhode Island at the time. So I traveled as a young person um, pretty frequently, three or nights a week after school on a bus. The bus was about an hour. And you know, I think back to those years of my life. I mean, it was a very exciting time. But also, I think it would have decreased a lot of the stress levels I felt. and maybe felt more connected if I had been able to um, Skype or FaceTime or even have a cell phone. During those years, there weren't. We didn't have a cell phone. So just a simple technology probably would have assisted in, in, in that sort of sense of connection for me. So I think about that now when I work with, with my current clients. But, but what do we actually mean by telehealth? I mean, I think there's always been some version of telehealth around. Absolutely. Yeah, so I, there's a slide here. So there's a large scope of telehealth. Um, telehealth includes advice lines. So many of you out there that are participating today may be um, using advice lines yourself as practitioners. Video conferencing. So I know many um, organizations now do um, teleconferencing across state lines. Um, support groups that are being run online. File transfers that most practitioners use at this point, HIPAA compliant file transfer. And telepharmacy. And I think that's one of the more, more generally understood uses of telehealth. Um, when your doctor sends an e-prescription in, that is telehealth. Here today, I, I like to use the term telebehavioral health because we're actually really speaking specifically to mental health counseling and behavioral health provision through the use of technology. Yeah, uh, that, that helps to have a little clearer about what we're talking about because it's such a new field. Um, yeah. I really like what you said in the video about extending the reach of clinical services to other populations, to other parts of the country. But then it occurred to me, our country still has a digital divide. And so what if you live in an area that doesn't have broadband access, or if you can't afford a computer? Or I guess you could maybe use your cell phone. I don't know. I mean, how does yeah. that work? I mean, it's a great question, and I think um, it comes up quite often. I remember back in undergrad, I took a course on the digital divide, and that was in the, the late 90s. And I think you know, we've been thinking for a long time about what does it mean to be wired or not wired. We know so much information is flowing right now um, through the internet. And I think what we're seeing is a, a big burst of new invention for technology using cell phones. We're seeing a lot more t uh, behavioral health technology through cell phones, and I have um, some information here, and folks can download these and see them later. But um, the data that's being collected right now, at least by the FCC, is showing that in the US, um, the folks with um, without access to mobile broadband, so that's what we would consider a mobile device, it's only about 1% of the population versus about 10% um, of our population doesn't have access to broadband. So the issue really right now is 
broadband hardwiring. So in rural communities, there's a lot of um, work being done with the federal government, but also um, state by state um, access programs. So there's some really interesting links that I put in the resource handout on some studies that are being done right now to increase rural access to broadband technology. So there's a, it's a really salient question to this conversation. Yeah. Um, well, it's good to hear that the digital divide is beginning to be a little less steep, perhaps. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's a lot more widely understood that this is a barrier to care as well. I see. Because, um, yeah, I, I know we've done several events on, on clinical services for veterans, and they yeah. may be a group that needs to be reached through these methods. Um, I remember several people bringing up telehealth, you know, in those, those discussions. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have one more question because I'm allowed to ask three questions as the non-specialist yeah. before we hand over to our other expert, Beth Councilman Carpenter. Um, sure. But I know you're not easily daunted um, by anything online, um, and I know I you were. Know that's true, but yes. <laughs> You never met a challenge you didn't want to meet. You, that's how you struck me when we first met. And and you are one of the first people to teach in our online campus. And I know from talking to students that they love having your classes. They say this unprompted by me, that that they really got a lot out of your class. So, um, But I'm wondering, when you t decided to deliver telehealth online, how steep was that learning curve for you? Um, I would say it was a little bit steeper, mostly because I had an amazing support team at Columbia when I moved my courses to the online platform. So um, I worked in a team environment. I think for me, working online collabor co collaboratively is really actually crucial. So um, when you're in private practice, there's a lot of opportunity to collaborate, but I do think we work often more alone. And so it felt like there was a lot more decision making I had to determine by myself. Um, mm -hmm. to figure out what my own needs were as a clinician in using technology and negotiating a lot of ethics and policy. And, and that's a, a great segue because I think that's what we're really going to be talking about today. We're going to talk a lot about what, what's coming up for folks in the audience. Um, uh, if you're interested, it looks like the majority is interested today, so that's really exciting. So I'm looking forward to talking with Beth about that. Yeah, yeah. it's a super exciting topic. But did you actually when you actually went into telehealth, did you go in gradually? Did you, I mean, did you just hang up Very your shit and say, I'm doing yes. this? Or? No. Um, I would say it was driven by clients, uh, actually. So this is really something that's client-centered for me. Um, if clients hadn't asked for it or really taken to it um, well, I don't know that it's something I would have immediately thought to include. I think this year more than ever, there's a lot more dialogue happening in the social work profession about technology. It's becoming a much bigger conversation for everybody, um, mostly because of the state um, parity laws that we're seeing change with insurance and, and billable services. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say that uh, it was driven by clients, and there has been a steep learning curve. And I've been very gradually increasing the ways in which I use technology directly with my practice. Yeah. Do you do you remember being nervous the first time that you were yeah. offering telehealth over? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'd love to see in the chat too what folks I know we have some folks in the room who currently provide um, telebehavioral health. Um, but absolutely. It's just and it's similar to teaching for the first time. I, I sort of, you know, have to really draw a lot of attention to the fact that I'm communicating through a screen, um, that there's tech glitches, right? That we should expect those tech glitches. Yeah. It's not if, but really when. So there's just there's a different level of um, awareness that I that I have to sort of utilize when I'm when I'm online. Well, that's good. I like your humility. <laughs> well, thank so you. Both. Here I am, our timekeeper, and I'm going to invite up Professor Beth Councilman Carpenter, and she's going to share some great information with us. Welcome. Thank you, Mattia and Mary Leah, and also Amelia. I'm very excited to be presenting with her today. Um, some great questions are coming up in chat. And I just want to follow up a little bit about that learning curve and, and jumping in. Because when I um, started actually doing research uh, using um, through qualitative research online, I, my participants brought it to me the same way that my clients did. And I think something so critical 
to remember, and we'll talk more about this in polls, is being transparent with our clients and being transparent with our participants and saying, you know, this is, I'm, I'm learning this with you and I'm going to join with you and we can be experts together in figuring out what happens when there's a glitch. And we'll come back and talk about this a little bit later. Um, but how I initially got into telebehavioral health services was I work with a lot of young adults um, who are transitioning either to leaving home and joining the workforce, uh, joining the military and being deployed, and also going off to college. So my first client who brought it to my attention was leaving for school, and was trying. we were trying to find transitional services on campus. But as many of us as practitioners know, our campus services are very taxed in terms of need, in terms in terms of cost, in terms of time. So she came back to me and said, I, I can't get an appointment. You know, I don't meet criteria. I'm not in crisis. What do I do? And so I said, give me a call. And we had a phone session. And that very quickly evolved into, um, can we FaceTime regularly? And so together, she and I began to plan out what would it look like to sit down and meet. And it allowed a, a really rich connection where when she started having problems with her housemates, I could see the space that she was in. And she could show me if she was getting up and making her bed every day. I could see her living space in a way that I couldn't in my residential office. Um, the, another client who brought it to my attention was actually a much older client who kind of called me out on my ageism. I hadn't broached with this client the option for telebehavioral health sessions. And she was a woman who had struggled with very severe major depressive disorder. It had been treatment resistant. And our whole team had worked really hard um, in getting her the services she needed. And as she got healthier, uh, one of the things that really helped her was uh, providing child care for a grandchild who lived very far away. And she wanted to, to keep with her treatment. And so again, she came to me and said, what can we do about continuing our sessions when I'm you know, across the country um, taking care of my grandchildren? And I said, oh, well, we could FaceTime or Skype. And she said, did you think I was too old to do something like that? I know how to use the FaceTime. You know, what would those sessions look like? And the fact that she called me out on being ageist and only wanting to use it with young adults really helped me reframe it. So um, again, Amelia and I are going to talk a little bit about um, how to start doing telebehavioral health and the, the logistics of it. But having a client who's willing to enter into it with you, um, I think, is the first step and being transparent about it um, and the things that may come up. When I was doing my research, um, I did a qualitative dissertation on the lived experience of mothers whose children were born unexpectedly with Down syndrome. And I did research up and down the East Coast, but I wasn't sure how to tap into rural communities or communities of mothers who couldn't get to these interviews because they were taking care of their children whom they couldn't find or didn't feel comfortable finding childcare for. And I realized I was excluding this whole group of, of moms. And my research was based in feminist theory, which is the personal, is political, and being where the moms are at. And so I reached out to a participant and I said, you know, I started digging into Skype research. How would you feel about sharing your narrative with me over Skype? And you'll see in the resources some studies that show you how Skype interviewing is done. And I'd be happy to answer questions when we get to that section about doing um, you know, qualitative research online and what it looks like. But I want, I want to be mindful of answering all these great questions and sharing a dialogue with Amelia. So I'd like to invite her back up on camera. And now we're going to hear from all of you about your experience and some more discussion. Hi, Amelia. Hi. It's good to see you, Beth. You too. I'm filled with lots of questions about your practice as well. And I think our participants are. I'm just watching the, the chat is. Very full. So we have a poll up here. Um, so do you currently provide uh, telehealth services? And um, it's great to see these responses coming in. Um, seeing a lot of folks saying, I'm thinking about it and leaning toward yes. So I'm curious, Beth, for you, um, when you had that moment of leaning toward, yes, I want to try this with clients, was there a particular um, issue that helped you or a, a resource that helped you to kind of flow um, into starting to use into using technology like is there was there um, a platform that you tried or a certain conversation that you remember kind of tipping the scales for you it looks like we have a lot of folks who are thinking about it 
Absolutely. You know, for me, it was realizing that my client was going not, was not going to get services where she was. And at the time, this was prior to really having a lot of great information about HIPAA compliance. There, the standards yeah. for online support groups were developing, but this was direct practice. So we literally, and at the time, I didn't even have an iPhone. So we went to Skype. And that was where we started. And, I, and it forced me to really be a practitioner researcher because I had to say, what's out there? How do I get paid for this? What will this look like? Um, and at the time, there weren't standards. So there was this gray area. We were still having conversations around mental health parity just for services, behavioral health services versus medical services. Mm -hmm. So that's I jumped in and then did the work. And I now have a, a much more streamlined process. But that's how I was led yeah. to it. What was your starting experience like? I mean, it was actually really similar. And I think um, this idea of the evidence-based practice, right, that we're actually going to the literature, that we have to do research. And I, as students ask often, you know, we talk a lot about evidence-based practice. And I think for, for new and emerging areas of our work, sometimes the evidence isn't there yet um, regarding effectiveness. And so for those of you that are thinking about this and leaning towards, yes, you may also be in a contemporary population of practitioners who are going to start trying this. And, um, you know, we kind of, we, we need more folks that are, are willing to try and experiment. And as long as it's client driven, I think there's, um, there's a real, there's, you know, real evidence that this could be useful. So I know for myself, um, it was that clients were asking for it. And, um, it, again, it was the young adults saying, hey, you know, I have a very short window between classes. Can I, can I FaceTime with you or Skype with you instead of coming to the office? And, and noticing how much their stress I work with, mostly with anxiety disorders, how much the use of technology actually assisted the treatment in terms of reducing anxiety, that for me I think was the tipping point as well, was noticing that there was a real ability to align the use of technology with some of the goals for treatment, that it was completely um, supportive of that and not um, something that was undermining their, their efforts outside of the session. So I do see there's a few folks in the audience that are leaning towards no, and um, I would love to hear your concerns too. We're going to talk about the pros and cons of this in a minute as well. Um, yeah, so I'm wondering, we have another poll, I believe, as well, right, that we're going we're gonna to pull up. Great. Let's see what this one is. Great. So um, Amelia and I have um, very similar approaches, but different manifestations. So I started out by using Skype and found with some of my clients, uh, there was a resistance to try any other platform. People were familiar with Skype from speaking to relatives and friends abroad. They were very comfortable. And at the time I started, there wasn't HIPAA compliance. And so I have to be very transparent about saying, I cannot protect your information from a HIPAA perspective. I can guarantee that I will speak to you in a private area, that I will not share my information, that the client confidentiality will be there, but that this isn't a HIPAA compliant platform. And Amelia has a different experience, and I'd love to hear more about yeah. yours. Yeah, so I, I was um, sharing earlier that I don't actually use Skype. So I think Skype has become sort of the catch-all phrase for teleconferencing, which I've noticed is kind of interesting. Um, I'll find myself saying Skype, but actually what I really mean is I use a site called Doxy. Um, I don't use um, Skype because it's not HIPAA compliant, and I've had actually some issues with um, the video feed, so I've, I, it tends to get really choppy. Um, and I provide supervision for a few students um, who are in the field um, and overseas. They're not, they're not in the U.S., and they, they call in for um, support and resourcing. Um, and some training, and so Skype has, I found that to be not as strong of a technology, but I do use Doxy, and um, I think we have a slide here, but but this is what Doxy looks like, and Doxy offers um, something called a BAA. So for those of you out there planning on using Skype or maybe um, thinking about looking at other platforms, there's a few websites that will offer a cross-comparison between these platforms. Um, Doxy offers a business associate agreement, it's called, and so in that agreement, they're agreeing to take um, full liability for the HIPAA compliance of their site, right? It's an encrypted site. They're very clear about that. A lot of medical providers use it. Um, I know that Skype doesn't have the capability to offer that. So practitioners make, you know, clearly we make different decisions based on our needs. Um, I also do the same Beth, with with a, a free statement about sort of the limitations of confidentiality, right? That I can absolutely guarantee my confidential behaviors do not change whether I'm online or in person. So the door is locked as it is right now. I'm in my office, so the door is locked. 
files are locked, there isn't anyone else in the room, I have sound machines on. You know, there's all the, the common precautions to ensure that there's confidential um, space. However, I've had a lot of challenges with, with finding um, uh, clients who aren't able to get the same confidential space in their own private time, right? So some clients calling me from the street, and there have been issues where I've had to really remind them, we have had this agreement, I, you can't call me from the street. We can talk, but I can't, I'm not going to discuss content with you in public, or they have a partner there that they're trying to talk about in their session. They say, oh, no, it's fine, it's fine. And so in situations like that, I find we have to definitely renegotiate and revisit those initial, um, initial agreements. Um, and that's for phone calls or FaceTime. So um, for, for the doxy, just to say that this is kind of the format, if you, if you look down the screen, very simple. So client clicks the link that I send them. It sends them to a waiting room like this. My face is there. Um, and then this slide just talks about, I usually have an inspirational quote or a meditation that they can watch. They type their name in, and it alerts me that they're in the waiting room. So if I have a few clients in a row and they're early, they could do the meditation, and then I join them. Um, so that's what it looks like for me. Um, I'm curious also for you what other, what other kinds of conversations have come up with clients about negotiating um, using technology besides the confidentiality. Are there other interesting things that have happened? Well, absolutely. Um, it's been actually a great way of keeping on point with some of our self-care goals and objectives oh. about carving out this time, carving out private space, setting limits and boundaries with family members. Um, but the other place it comes up often is with texting. And I'm, I'll be curious to see in chat. I saw someone asked about FaceTime being HIPAA compliant. And it is not um, HIPAA compliant either. And I would encourage anyone who researches HIPAA compliant platforms, look at the reviews, yeah. see where people have commented on glitches. But in terms of texting, um, texting is not HIPAA compliant. I will use texting to reschedule appointments to set up a phone session if someone is in crisis, but I will not discuss any clinical content. There are some, you know, as we become a more tech-centered uh, society, I think there's this, hey, I'm having a hard day, can I talk to you? And they want to have those conversations over text, and I can't protect the information necessarily. It could be while we're on the street. So I do have a lot of limits around um, the content of text, and it needs to be more logistics in setting up a session than it is in the behavioral sessions as well. Yeah, Same I'm here. curious what your experience has been like. Yeah, it's great to hear this. It's really useful, actually. I don't know if it is for participants, I hope, but that there's a lot of alignment. It seems like I'm, I'm fascinated that in our own sort of silos of practice, we figure out a lot of shared um, ways of navigating these conversations. But same thing, I, I enjoy texting with clients in terms of the scheduling. I find it's much quicker, it's efficient. Um, clients say it reduces their anxiety again. So if they're running late, their train is delayed, they text me and let me know. But I will not discuss um, content from sessions in a text message. And that's also because I've had so many couples and families come in where actually one of the major issues for work is a breach of trust or a, a breach of confidence in the relationship based on a text. So I, I, I see probably 80% of couples that I, that I see, there's some dilemma with text messaging or some form of a social media platform. So something that they posted um, that really is a trigger. Um, and so I, I explained to everybody, you know, it's useful if we don't include content in these texts in case somebody reads them. And that's, that's also a way that confidentiality can be breached, right? A partner can pick up your phone. So great, we have a, we're, we're moving towards talking about the ethics, and I see questions in the chat. We are, we do have time today, so we've left time to just really answer a lot of the questions. We have someone tracking that. So just so you know, if you're putting questions there, we're definitely going to circle back around and make sure we can try to address as many as possible. Um, so here we are thinking about ethics, right? That's what I guess you and I are really talking about here is like what are the, the additional ethical concerns? Um, and I think for our field in particular, you know, that's one of our top priorities, right? Do no harm. And we're thinking about our clients as um, having full agency over their care. There's something about technology that feels like a third party sometimes. It's really a third hand in the room. And I think, you know, we're, we're naming all the ways that we're setting up um, process or protocol, additional contracting. So we're asking here, too, which of these um, do you all out there um, find the most important in deciding on whether um, telehealth treatment is appropriate? Um, and it looks like uh, the risk assessment, if the risk assessment is moderate, right? So I'd, I'd love to hear from you, Beth, a little bit more about kind of how you assess for risk and 
how that factors into your practice too. Well, um, I always start out with requesting that clients come in for a live assessment so that that's re done residentially. And if someone is has just been discharged from an inpatient unit, especially for um, an attempt, attempted suicide or active suicidal ideation, if someone is just coming out of a medical detox facility and is very um, newly in recovery, those are the clients that I will screen out initially and ask that they come in residentially for a period of time until we've established a treatment alliance, until I have a sense of what other supports are there. Um, and I'm very upfront about that. It's only after some time and their treatment has evolved that I would consider then adding in. And I also tend to use a hybrid um, modality with higher risk clients. So we may do one um, Skype session and then two or three residential sessions. I tend to prefer um, using a screen to see each other, like we're looking at each other now, I can see you nodding and smiling or looking away. Then I do phone sessions again with higher risk clients. I prefer to, to get as much of the energy as I possibly can. Yeah. Um, so that's been my experience. And again, the higher risk someone is, I may ask for you know two or three assessment sessions before moving forward. What's your experience yeah. been like? And I, I see some questions about that regarding self-harm, so it's, it's great to hear you talking about that. Yeah, I, it, um, a little bit different, but similar in that um, the way that I've chosen currently to use any kind of telebehavioral health is as an integrated practice. So I'm actually not, um, and this is, by experience, I've tried seeing clients only online. So the intake is done online, all servicing is done online. I find that for myself as a practitioner, I feel very disconnected. Um, so I, I really do prefer to be personally just in a room at least one time with somebody. If that isn't feasible, um, and I have tried this, um, it's gone it's gone well. But for me, just my own self-reflection around my relationship to the work, it has felt really different. So. Similarly around risk, um, if somebody is geographically not located in the same location, I include an additional uh, risk planning and safety sort of safety planning measure. So there's an additional dialogue there about, okay, let's let's talk about if this ever um, there ever is a need for me to provide you with additional resources and support, where would I go? Right? Do you who are your networks if you have them? If you've re recently relocated somewhere, let me do some research for you and and help you find what's going on in your local area so that I have documented where I would turn to and what I might remind the client they have access to. Um, I've encouraged a few clients this year to reach out to local practitioners as well to have backup. And I think, you know, for the relocation, it's really tricky because folks really, um, it's an amazing way that we can continue and have continuity of care, right, when someone leaves their home city or graduates college. But I am exploring with a few young adults in particular that this is a short term. Um, solution and that eventually there'll be a bridge over to maybe somebody in their local community. Um, and so I'm trying, I'm also, it's, it's hybrid and I think for me that's where I'm finding the most sense of agency and utility with technology is that it's not for me like a pendulum swing between everything's in person or every, everything has to be online. Like there's a nice blending somewhere in the middle. And I know that that's just about my, my context of work and I, I think some folks in the audience today it sounds like you work in clinic environments where all your work may be online. So curious to hear more about that, too. Yeah, and I just want to look at the survey results, too. I just want to kind of check out what folks are saying. Um, ah, so whether the client has resources they can access in person is also coming up. Yeah, OK. Um, so we've talked about, you know, you said that you had considered seeing uh, clients fully online. And when you were building your practice and deciding this modality, what was the first thing you did to get started and what would your advice be? I know so many of our participants seem like they're really excited about blending this into their practice. Yeah. Um, so it seems like folks are interested, which I think is the, the biggest piece, right? That it doesn't feel like you're being forced or that this is a necessity of your work. Um, again, if it's client driven and it's a necessity, then I would say the first thing to do is contact a colleague and have a, a peer dialogue about what does it mean for somebody else that you know to be working in an online environment? I think for me, again, if I think back to the online teaching, my pathway really, it was sort of a dual pathway into this work, which was clients were asking for it, and simultaneously I was starting to work online on um, teaching courses at Columbia. And just the experience of teaching online actually was really assistive in how 
much I wanted to include this with my client-based work, but um, the first thing is check in with yourself because this is not for everybody. I know plenty of practitioners who have very solid rationale, strong rationale about why this won't work for them. And I think that that's fair. I think that's okay. A part of our responsibility in social work, right, is to know our limitations. So um, I do think that checking in with yourself, if you're someone who's here today and you're saying, well, I'm curious, I'm interested, I know a couple of colleagues who do this, but is it for me? I would say start slowly. Try it working with a client you have a strong relationship with who's already expressed interest. So then you have both parties being duly interested and you may um, get to skip those initial sort of um, awkward moments if you already have a, a relationship. See how it feels and then process that. Bring that back to session and talk about, you know, how does it actually feel? Does it feel different? I've been shocked by what clients have said to me. I've, I've had a client say, you know, I actually feel closer to you when I'm on the phone with you. Mm. Really interesting, right? Maybe not my experience, but that's their experience. So, yeah, what were the first things that, that, that you would recommend, too? I'm really curious about your pathway in and how, what you would recommend here. Well, the one thing I wouldn't recommend that I did was I jumped into it with my clients and then I didn't know how to get paid. And I see a lot of questions yes. about that. Yes. And so I went, oh, wait a second. Am I providing a non-billable service? Because that's going to be a problem for everyone. Yes. So it, it required um, conversations with my clients and also calling, yes. um, you know, the insurance companies with whom I was contracted to say, what does this look like? And we'll get more into that in, in a few minutes. But... Um, I actually hold licenses in two states, in New York and right. Connecticut, and they have different rules. So right. I know you're from uh, our participants are from all over the world. So right. check in with the panels that you're on. Um, in New York, um, telebehavioral health is covered. In Connecticut, I usually have to do a clinical review that justifies mm -hmm. that my service can't be provided elsewhere right. in that client's city of residence. So if okay. someone – and so – that can lead to some conversations. Usually, more often than not, those sessions are covered. And if they won't be in an ideal situation, I can have a conversation with my clients before we move to that. It doesn't always happen that way. And then sometimes we'll have to talk about self-pay or self-paid co-pays or sliding scale. But So I would recommend everyone check out the panels that you're on or the agencies for whom you practice um, yeah. first. Um, before moving into then researching what platforms work for you and what platforms work for your clients. My clients, to generalize a little bit, seemed intimidated about downloading um, a separate platform. But it sounds like, Amelia, for you, your clients were willing to jump in and you have a lovely virtual waiting room that Skype doesn't provide. So I think yeah. knowing, knowing yourself as a practitioner is so important, like you said. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I am learning a lot about Connecticut right now, and I think, I mean, there's a lot to say about the law, and I know many of you have those questions. I've included in the resources, there is a link to a, a website that will provide you state-by-state state, um, health parity law, so you can actually research what your state covers. It is very different state-by-state. State. I believe 22 states have general telehealth parity right now, meaning they are billable, but that does not always include telebehavioral health, so I really want to say that. Um, New York just a year ago uh, began um, honoring telebehavioral health sessions um, as long as the client resides in the state in which they're receiving treatment and the clinician is licensed in the state that the client resides in, meaning in New York you both need to be in New York, right? So both people need to be in New York um, and it's really, a, it's called a CPT add-on. So for those of you in private practice, you're using a CPT code, right, like a 90837, 90834, and then there's an add-on to that. And you have to call each, um, uh, like I work a lot with Affordable Care Act, you have to call each provider, uh, I'm sorry, each insurance company and find out what they require for providers. So company to company, they also may be prepared differently for accepting those as billable services. Um, so there is, you know, to go back to the learning curve question from the very beginning of today, there's a big learning curve when it comes to this component um, of the work. And... Uh, for me, I have a, a very broad sliding scale, and I do a lot of pro bono work. And so um, I think for me, this also provides a really flexible option for folks who really need resourcing and services but may not be able to come in. And then maybe this also assists in, for me, supporting a sliding scale and my, sort of my more um, politicized aspects of the work, which is really trying to provide as much universal care as possible and not having insurance provision be a barrier to that.
Yeah. No, that's great. Thank you. I think um, it's almost time for us to start question Q and A. So right on time. Yes. <laughs> Hello. So I'm here to be the voice of our participants who um, okay. have been asking questions. So I've collected them all. And one question that's come up a few times is how to get those handouts. So if you go whoops, over to the left here, you can click on telehealth handout and download file and then slides and download file <laughs> right there on the left. And we'll also, if you have any trouble doing it that way, we'll email them out as well. So uh, we've got a lot of questions because folks have been okay. asking really great questions. And um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just sorting through here. So, um, Ethan asks, um, he'd love to hear more about how this unfolds in rural environments. Mm -hmm. And I think we said uh, we were going to try to do, got it, whoever wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I mean, I don't, I don't know that I have it. I work in an uh, urban setting. Um, I do uh, have a real interest right now, and in where my next sort of goal for my practice is that I'm going to be outreaching in New York, rural, some rural LGBT um, centers, and, and determining um, what their access may be like to clinicians in that area, um, and providing that in this in state. Um, but I don't have experience working in rural areas. If folks work in rural areas and want to um, respond, I also think it'd be great to hear. There's 227 people in this room right now, so. I'm imagining that that question is coming up for many folks. I can say there's a lot of research being done and some pretty national efforts being made to increase um, work to, in rural areas. I've read a lot of that research because I've, I'm in that research and information gathering stage. I've included links to two of those um, large uh, organizations and, and uh, rural projects for health. So again, in the, in the resource guide, you should be able to, to check those out. But what's fascinating is that they've done some pretty longitudinal studies and found that for follow-up medical care, this is one of the most effective practices in rural areas. So instead of having clients right come back for checkups or to check in after a procedure like a surgery, this is, this is actually working um, more effectively and so doing a Skype or an online session. So I'm curious for behavioral health as well after hospital discharge and things like that, what we might find if we start really extending this to behavioral health. Great. And Susan asks, um, do you need to complete a certificate program in order to become a telebehavioral health provider? Um, well, I can start with that. I know Amelia has some information on that as well. Um, I think that the more information you have, the more thorough the services you can provide. So it is recommended that now, I, and I have done, I have not done a certificate program. I've done postgraduate trainings, webinars similar to this, and, and at residential conferences. Um, but there is a certificate that you can get to be an online telebehavioral health provider. And for those of you who are interested in, in having your practice maximize that capacity, I would definitely recommend it because it goes through all the different platforms um, and the different kind of issues that come up and the clients in which you can um, use this platform with. So Amelia, I don't know if you want to add to that a little bit. Yeah, um, you know, I, I think that the more certificates that we can get, the more training, the better, right? There's, I mean, clearly there's a lot of questions here. I know I still have lots of questions. I think what we're really talking about is an emerging field. So um, I've heard some positives and negatives from folks who've gotten cert certified or attended some trainings. I will say there's a great clearinghouse, one of the oldest and the first large training institutes is the Telemedicine Institute. And I've, again, I've included that in the resource guide really wonderful webinars. I've met the director and founder. She's really a wealth of knowledge and has been in the work for about, you know, most of her career. And she talks openly, I've, I've seen her speak at conferences, she talks about the fact that most of um, American medicine, at least, has been using telemedicine for, for quite a while now in social work, and behavioral health is sort of the final group that's getting involved in this. And so she's really invested in having social workers and mental health providers show up at more trainings. There are a lot of doctors that are currently using telemedicine. So sort of as a call to our field, I think it might be great to get certified or to participate in a webinar just to connect with other practitioners, um, if not for the certificate itself. Great. So here's a logistical. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Logistical question from Susan. 
How do you get your copay if the client's not physically in the office? Um, well, I, we, we may have similar answers or different answers. I'm not yeah. sure. Usually, because it's someone I've met in person, um, they've, we've gone through all the paperwork together, and I have them sign an agreement. And um, because I am in private practice and I do a ton of pro bono work, I actually don't take credit cards because the percentage that we pay is still so high. So I, I take old-fashioned checks and um, either from an, directly from my client or from their insurance company, and they just mail it to me. And so sometimes that means I have a four to six week delay in getting that copay paid for if I'm waiting for it from the insurance company. Um, usually my clients are pretty good about making sure that I have my check within a week. I usually ask for it to be mailed the day of the session as if they would hand it to me during our session. And most, most clients are compliant with that. For colleagues of mine who use Square and other um, credit cards, they'll just swipe, the, they'll put the number in manually right after the session. So that's been my experience. What about you, Amelia? Um, so I actually only take payment generally. I mean, I will take cash, but it's very rarely. Um, again, I'd say 99%. I think I have one client that I can think of now who doesn't do this, but 99% of my clients have asked me, can I just do an e-pay option? And so I actually use, I'll type it into chat in a second, but I use... Um, uh, a practice management software called Simple Practice. It's really simple and wonderful. Everything is done um, online, and it it's actually linked to Stripe, which is kind of like Square. So there is, I mean, the down. I'll say the downside is that there's a certain percentage taken off the top, right? So there's a third party um, percentage taken from each payment. So that's the downside. the 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 bonus here is that it automatically invoices. There's um, an immediate um, ability to see if the client paid and they feel like, okay, you know I've paid. So there's sort of a, a, a different sense of there's lack of communication, you know, if something gets lost in the mail for me. Um, and then uh, overall, I just find it easier to print out a super bill or a bill for their insurance if they're working toward a deductible. It sort of tracks all of that. So for me, I found it to be a little bit easier, but I see that, I think Stacy wrote in that you use Venmo and Square and PayPal. Um, and there, again, there's pros and cons to each of those platforms. I personally don't use PayPal. Um, I've heard, like, I've just read a lot about um, security breaches with it, so I try to use a third party encrypted. I don't see the credit card numbers. I should also say that. So Stripe keeps those encrypted and secured. I don't see those. Um, so that also, for me, feels like a little bit more of a, a safe way to have a financial transaction. So that's how I get a copay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Leah asks, um, she has heard from cl clinicians that they find it difficult to make eye contact with their clients via telehealth. Are there any comments or concerns that have come up for you regarding eye contact? Interesting. Um, I'll start with my perspective is I just remind myself to look up, you know, and I think this is where online teaching has actually really encouraged my strength to yeah. make eye contact, to to smile, to remember that I'm not a talking head. Um, and, you know, sometimes when I when I do sessions actually from my home office, which is where I am today, occasionally I have a, a rogue little kitten who will sneak into my office without me seeing and he'll jump on screen. And, and showing that I'm a real person I think has enriched sessions. So it's just a matter of checking in and remembering that I'm talking to a person, not a screen. So if I, you know, I, my phone is away, the door is locked is locked, except for when the kitten opens it, um, and, you know, all of my ringers are off. So I really do try to get myself, and I take a moment or two before a session to go, this is just like a residential session. We're having the same conversation, and so I, I try to look up and not down at my keyboard because that creates a distance. Yeah. Took some practice. Yeah. And I mean, we have a lot going on on the screen, right? I just want to kind of recognize that I know we're all looking at multiple, you know, I'm looking at Chad, I'm looking at slides, I'm looking at Beth and Mattia. But in a, in a virtual therapy session, it's just me and the client. I don't have a chat window open. I'm not, my attention isn't split. So um, I agree, online teaching for me has just really been a game changer because it's allowed me to develop my own online presence. So I know what works for me. Um, I really need little breaks, and so often, like in a 45-minute session, I'll usually do an online session a little bit shorter, and we'll check in after 20 minutes. So at 20 minutes, we'll take like a tea break, or we'll do a breathing exercise or something, a mindfulness piece. Um, I often have tea or coffee, and I'll 
clink it up on the screen and we'll have like a moment just like we would in the office. So I, I, I love, you know, the kitten walking through. It's sort of the same thing. Yeah, it's, I have my green juice here. You can see where <laughs> is it. There it is. You know, so, I, you know, I, it's sort of, you know, I think it's making it as human as possible, right? That for me, it isn't just eye contact. It's actually, it is facial expression. You know, if I have students who are just completely neutral faced, it's very stressful. I'm like, hello out there, you know, and it's the same with a client one on one. But I find the tolerance level for being online is much shorter um, for sessions. I do, I rarely have a full 45 minutes. Um, most of my clients at about 30, 35 start to kind of feel like they don't want to stay in this zone. So we set up activities and things for them to do in the final 10 minutes on their own. Oh, that's so interesting because my, my, I actually find that I have to really sit on that 50 minutes and not oh. have it extend into an hour, often because yeah. a client will say, this is the book that I'm reading, or here, let me pull okay. up and do a, a screen share of this. Or So... Uh -huh. um, because there's so much more going on, I find that sometimes those sessions go a little bit longer. Um, so interesting compare and contrast. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. So uh, we've got Matthew with a question about what can you use telehealth with? Are services limited to behavioral programs like CBT or DBT, or are psychodynamic relational models applicable? Absolutely, they're applicable, yeah. I mean, you can, I mean, I would, I would just say practitioners have, we have range, right? We have control and agency over how we do our work. So if you're CBT oriented, maybe you're trying CBT online, but I would say this crosses most modalities. I can't, I mean, even somatic work, right? I do somatic experiencing. I'm EMDR trained. Um, I do tapping in and I do a lot of somatic experiencing or EFT work, emotional freedom um, techniques. I do that through the screen. So I, I can, you know, a client can sit there and actually do the same somatic integrated um, treatment as if they were in the room because um, they're doing it on themselves, right? I'm not in contact physically with the client. They're tapping on themselves or they're doing the EFT themselves. So I was at a training recently for EMDR, and a lot of clinicians there are doing EMDR with vets and also with um, homebound um, folks who have mobility challenges. Um, they're doing EMDR with them through um, teleconferencing. And they had great stories about it being effective. So um, I think it crosses modalities, in my opinion. But what do you think, Beth? One of the biggest challenges I've had is I did a lot of my postgraduate training in play and expressive arts therapy. Oh. And you'll see in the resources I've included the, the link to one of the first um, digital online art therapy groups. And what the findings with that have been is that the technology does not yet support the um, the same kinesthetic value of being in the room, and I found that digital sand play um, is is difficult to make happen. Um, I can do parent guidance and parent coaching online, where they're showing me their play space and where they're setting aside dedicated time. So something like filial therapy or parent-child interactional therapy can be really augmented by online. But direct play therapy, whether it's child-centered or directive um, and expressive arts, the technology is not quite there yet. Um, again, music therapy, um, where we create a playlist together, there are specific exercises that we can draw in. Um, but I, I, I'm really curious to see where that will go in our field in the next decade um, as technology catches up with the practice. So I see Bonnie's pointing out a question that's come up a few times, which is, can you be licensed in one state and treat somebody who lives in a different state? Oh, great question. Um, I have found, for my experience, and it helps that I am licensed in two states, um, but it depends on the insurance company. So um, one insurance company, the I lived in one state, my client lived in another state, and the employer was in a third state. So the states that were involved ended up being Mass like Massachusetts, New York, and Connecticut overall. And so we had to do some negotiating. And again, it was proving that services were not available in other states for us to get um, paid for. So it really does depend. And I found as, um, as insurance companies have kind of been more splintered and managed by outside sources, you really have to call um, and check the benefits and say, if their residential address is here, California, and my residential office is here, will that be covered or not? Um, and if I see, Bonnie, you're typing, if they're self-paying, 
um, then I'll accept them paying me directly. Um, and they're welcome to submit it to their insurance company, but sometimes that's a little trickier. So it's a great question, and it's, it's complicated to answer with the state of you know, insurance coverage right now. Amelia, have you had a similar or different experience? Uh, similar. I mean, again, I the clients that I'm currently doing any form of telehealth with that are not living in state have transitioned from being insurance-based clients to um, self-pay because they've either lost their insurance when they left the state um, or their insurance changed. Um, but in terms of insurance law in New York, you need to reside in the state that the client, you know, they need to be in New York and you need to be in New York. So I see a lot of questions about vacation. So technically, that's not billable. So if someone's on vacation and you're trying to bill their their HMO um, and be reimbursed for that, that's t I mean, technically, they're not in the state. They're not currently there um, in office or um, covered, right? So if they're out of state, it's different. Um, I'm sure practitioners make their own personal decisions about navigating all of these insurance um, policies and loopholes. But for myself, I only see people who are residing in New York using telebehavioral health. Um, and folks that have left the state, it, they do become sliding scale um, cash paying clients, um, so self pay. Um, again, you know, we can't overstate it that you really should check out your state's laws. They're changing all the time. And um, NASW is tracking that, but also there's a couple key websites where they'll, they're constantly updating. And sometimes those laws change and it's not publicly known. I know that in New York that law changed and a lot of social workers were not aware of it. Um, so I remember when the law changed, a lawyer actually informed us of this, and it really shifted how I imagined the scope of my work. But I was talking to other colleagues, and people hadn't heard about this. So it's, we're really at the very beginning stages. At least in New York, we're just a year in. Um, so, I, so I think check out your state. Georgia is another state with a lot of parity. So Georgia is doing an immense amount of work in rural populations to extend care. And um, if, if you're in Georgia and you're interested, I have a colleague that I could put you in touch with who would be happy to answer your questions, um, specifically in Georgia. All right, so we're down to our last four minutes. So I want to reinforce how to download those slides and handouts, which are over here on the left side, <laughs> my pointing skills. So click, and then click on download. And if it doesn't work for you, we will email them out afterwards to everybody who registered. Um, and I want to invite everybody here to attend our future online events as well. The next one is going to be in February, February 15th, which is a Wednesday from 1 to 2, and it will be on global social work. So that will be a really interesting one. And I want to thank our uh, presenters here today, Professor Councilman Carpenter and Professor Ortega. Thank you so much for taking the time and answering all these questions. We really appreciate that you volunteered to do this. And thank, thank you to you. everyone who came today. Yes, great, great participants. Yes, it's been really <laughs> great to watch your conversations. And I'm really excited when we leave a dialogue with many more questions to be answered. So I think for me, this, this is exactly what I was hoping, is that we'd all start asking more and more. Mm -hmm. so it's great to be with all of you. Thanks so much. Yes, so thank we've you. Got some closing polls. And although we're going to end the event, uh, we are going to stick around uh, for about 20 minutes to do some informal chatting. And um, hopefully we'll get to some of the questions that have been coming up as well. But we welcome your key takeaways, any feedback you have, and we've got those handouts up here too. And I see some thank yous coming in as well for our presenters. So thank you to both of you. All right, so continuing with questions, um, Julia asked about the integration of families in teletherapy. Is that possible? Oh, and uh, Amelia, you might be muted. <laughs> Great. I don't know. I, I mean, Beth, you were talking about play therapy and directed play therapy, right, using using um, a teleconference. And I've also done um, some work with couples and also had, similar to your experience of sort of saying that you can see the environment a client's living in and how much richer that makes the session or sort of like an added layer of understanding their life. 
um, I've had family members pass through and say, oh, is that your therapist? Or, you know, and, and it's been interesting because, again, it was great material to process. Like, I learned about one particular client. I learned that she doesn't actually, her room doesn't have a door. I've learned, you know, I've learned all these things about um, how clients live by being able to watch who walks through the room. Um, and I do know quite a few practitioners who are doing family work online. So when all family members can't actually travel to be in the same place, they do it as a group session. So I have definitely, I know people are doing that. Um, the most experience I've had with it is with um, one client being able to come in residentially and another client calling in to participate and so everyone can be on the same page and hear the same thing. What I haven't yet had, and some of it has to do with the technology, is different family members calling in or mm -hmm. Skyping in from different places. So I, I'm very curious to see how that will look as the technology um, catches up in terms of, of family work. But I have had, um, if someone is working the night shift and can't come to a late session, they will call in instead. And so we'll all talk about how the week went. And I try to keep those conversations a little more concrete because I'm in the room with someone and not in the room with someone, um, but I definitely think it's it's feasible. It's a great question. So here's an interesting I'm, one that a couple people have asked. Um, Sue asks, "Is um, do, do clients ever request to record the session? I've never had that happen, no. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but I personally haven't had that happen. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't either. Yeah, I'd be curious if anyone. So I see some people ty typing in and and saying they've had. I've had residential sessions recorded where a client has wanted to remember a particular exercise we've done or a particular dialogue. They'll record snippets of it, but um, never online. Looks like Andrew has had it happen, and he had no problem with it. One client played back on played back the sessions. That's interesting. I could see how that could be really useful. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, uh, um, I saw a question here from, I think, Octavia about placements and doing field practicum using telebehavioral health. And I think, um, I just, I wanted to just add that I do know of one um, that was at Rikers Island doing, um, it's actually visitations, teleconferencing visitations between children and parents, incarcerated parents. So this is another application I, I don't think I mentioned earlier, but I do see a lot more um, teleconferencing for visitations and work being done uh, with folks um, who are working with incarceration um, and connection to family outside. Uh, Mary Jo asks, is there a difference in price between um, online or in-person or phone sessions? Um, not for me, but I will say that online actually I have to do more work around. Um, I really focus on being present. I really focus on my space, um, you know, in managing the technology and doing that research. You know, that's all kind of unpaid time. But no, my billing, um, my billing sc scale is the same. Mm -hmm. Amelia, what's your experience like? I mean, mine's a little, mine is a little different, just because I do sliding scale um, and sessions are shorter. Mm -hmm. I tend to have reduced rate. Um, controversial, I know, because some of the conversations I've had with colleagues is about the value of the service not really changing. Um, I just have found that, I mean, it really, again, it's very client-centered, but the clients that I do the telehealth with tend to be lower income and have relocated for, you know, economic reasons. And so it sort of dovetails with those needs as well. Mm -hmm. But I think the service is just as valuable. I don't know that it's, you know, I don't think it's an issue of worth. We've got a couple questions about clinical supervision for telehealth. How do you manage um, that? Yeah. That hasn't been a, a strong aspect of my telehealth practice, so I'm going to bounce that over to Amelia. So I, and I don't know, is the question about receiving clinical supervision or providing clinical supervision? But um, I received clinical supervision for the last year and a half through teleconferencing. I lived outside the state that I was like, I lived outside state lines, so I would come in for work, and I didn't want to come in again to do supervision. So I did my own, you know, I had my supervisor there. That was great because it was really flexible. We could eat lunch. Um, it just felt like sort of the whole energy of it was less stressful. Um, and then I am providing some resourcing and supervisory um, services to a couple individuals. And um, 
it's, I mean, it's going well. In fact, I find it's a lot better because we can keep a note of everything that's going on. We can use the chat pod. I can directly send links to the person. So it sort of consolidates everything I might normally be writing down and then or emailing to them. Everything's done in real time. So it's like I'll step outside the room, you know, for a real room. I'll step outside, look online, pull a resource in. We'll watch a video together. It's just a lot more, I find it a lot more dynamic. I really prefer it, actually. Ooh. So Allison's got a good question that Ina sec rec um, seconds, which is, what happens if a client becomes suicidal during a telehealth, telebehavioral health session? That's a, a great question. I, I think it ties into our conversation about risk. I'm very, very careful with um, a client that I'm seeing, in, seeing online and in telebehavioral health. Um, I try to minimize the risk starting off. Now, obviously, we don't always have control over that, so I do um, I try to make sure that I have resources available for them, whether it's um, an emergency crisis line, who it is that's in the house or building with them. Um, and the only time I can ever think of it really um, coming up is I was an adolescent I was working with had um, mono and so couldn't attend school or come in for about six weeks. So it was short term. And this adolescent had struggled with some despondency and hopelessness, some passive suicidal ideation, and as we were speaking, um, the conversation took that dreaded kind of turn for the worse where I thought, okay, and I said to this client, I said, I'm really starting to be concerned for your safety, and I can see, and we were doing it over FaceTime, um, we're not making eye contact anymore, you know, who else is in the house with you? And they said, my mom's here, but I'm not going to get her. And I said, well, I'm, I'm getting more concerned, and, you know, so I went through an assessment, and I thought, you know, my red flag is up, the hairs on the back of my neck are standing up, and I said, um, I'm going to set a line here, and if you don't reach out to your mom and go downstairs and get her and let her know what's going on, I'm going to call her on the house phone and let her know because I'm, I'm not feeling like this is a, a situation in which you could be kept safe. And she got up and got her mom and brought her mom in, and we came up with a plan, and um, and it went that way. So I, But I try to avoid those sessions, and if, I'm, if I have any concern really about someone's safety, again, it's about laying eyes on someone. So screen and FaceTime and Skype or Doxy versus a phone session um, mm -hmm. and making sure that you have resources to tap them into and or that you're comfortable enough that you have the address of where they are if you need to call 911. You know, it's about assuming risk. Amelia, I don't know what your experience has been like, but I'm, I'm curious to hear. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been similar. Um, I've had one instance where I had to do a similar um, sort of real-time assessment, but I think for myself, I do like to have an emergency contact, of course, on file, and we've discussed using that emergency contact. That person wasn't in the home, so it was more about my duty to call them um, and to pull other people into their care. And really, again, full transparency, saying, let's acknowledge what's happening. I'm here to support you, but I'm not physically there. So there's, you know, you can imagine that this may feel, you know, difficult for me because I can't do what I would normally do, which is either walk you into an ER or assist you in that process. So what, you know, what do we think we can come up with together? And um, I think that, again, we've mentioned it a few times, but this uh, technology requires a lot more transparency, a lot more preparation, and a different level of assessment. So um, I think one of the biggest concerns that, and I saw a, a statement earlier um, in chat, someone was talking about, do you think this is going to, you know, negatively impact our work or the sort of um, relationships we have therapeutically? I, I don't think, I think done well, this is very effective, but I would not recommend that if you're working with very high-risk clients where you really do believe that it would be better, the work would be better conducted in person, I wouldn't recommend that you try doing it only online. I think the hybrid model where you have a sense of somebody or you know where they live, that you have their address for safety reasons also is really important, right? And some of the issues that have been in the media more recently are about text-based therapy services where the clinician does not aware of where the client actually resides. They have to request that information from a third party. And I think to me that feels, just in terms of a practitioner, that feels like a little too hands-off for me. I would really like to have a little bit closer proximity to assisting um, in, with clients that are higher risk. So, so on a related note, um, what about malpractice insurance? Does it cover this modality? That's a great question. So um, my malpractice insurance is through NASW. So okay. 
um, it's folded in that way. So um, it works out well because, you know, NASW, and I think it's in the resources that Amelia provided about their stance on telebehavioral health. So um, again, it comes down also to the hours that you're covered for. You know, are you a 20-hour or 40-hour practitioner? Um, risk assessment, the umbrella, that piece. So um, it is folded in, but again, it depends on your insurance carrier and what their standpoint is. Yes, and I also have NASW insurance, and, and it is, you know, I would just recommend, similar to doing the research on parity law, research your insurance. Know exactly what it says, right? So, know how you're covered. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, and these questions are really important. I know I keep answering them very broadly, but the truth is it is very practice specific, so, and state by state. So, and I think, you know, I saw the question earlier, can only LCSWs do this work? And the answer is no. We know that there's plenty of doctors, psychiatrists, some surgeons. I mean, we're seeing lots of people in medicine are using telemedicine. Um, the, the, the issue is what are the standards for your field? What are the laws for your field? And what are the ethical concerns for your field? Um, and those, are, I think, are all points of research. I have to go. Um, and I keep delaying leaving, but um, I just want to say thanks again. And this was a great conversation, Beth. It's really exciting to hear about your work. And I feel like I'm probably going to call you and reach out for support soon. Um, there's lots of questions that are coming up. We'll so. have to meet online for our conversation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very easy. <laughs> Thank you, Mattia. And Thank you. To Natasha. Yes. And Mary Leah. Okay. Um, I, just, um, I know Amelia has to step out. I wanted to address Lori's question about um, scope of practice, and I think someone asked about coaching. Um, and yes, you can only, you know, as any type of behavioral health, you should really only practice within your scope. Um, so I'm not, like, I am not trained in EMDR like Amelia is, and so I would never attempt to offer that. Um, you need to be um, clear on what your training has been in. And same thing with coaching. I was not trained as a life coach. I was trained as a clinical social worker. So I'm very clear on offering clinical social work in a telebehavioral health format. That's the, the phrase that I use. Um, if you've been trained as a life coach um, or done a coaching certificate program, then you can use the language, but you need to be mindful of what your licensure and your training has been in. So just to address those questions I saw coming up. Yes, Lori M. Thank you. Great question. Yes. Thank you. And um, we talked a little bit about research. This is a really new field. Are there any journals that you know about focusing on evidence for telebehavioral health? Yes, um, there are actually a couple textbooks out, um, as well as journals. You want to look at um, qualitative research quarterly. Really, any of the main qualitative journals are, are doing a ton of research in um, accessing rural communities, accessing international communities. Um, the studies are just coming out, um, I'd say, starting around 2007. And you'll see in our resource packet, oops, that way. In our resource packet, um, a couple of the articles that informed my um, Skype-based interviewing that I did for my dissertation, um, two of the newest textbooks which were published through SAGE about doing qualitative interviewing and narrative inquiry using an internet-based platform. So definitely check those out. Um, and there are some online um, conferences that are having conversations about, you know, digitally informed research. And there are definitely some, um, there are definitely some differences. I had to, to speak about that in my own research, a live interview versus a Skype interview. And neither is better or worse, but you are looking at different nuances. Um, and it's a lot easier, actually, to record an entire interview using an online platform versus just audio recording or setting up a more intrusive video camera. Um, so we have a question from Veronica about co-facilitating via telecounseling. Do you ever do that with two um, remote counselors or with one local and one remote? No, but I have had, um, I work very closely with a local psychiatrist. We often cross-refer, and his office is down the hall from mine. And so we have done um, Skype sessions together. And we have also conference called um, in order to collaborate care, um, especially for a client who's homebound. Uh, he works um, with a lot of elderly clients who sometimes can't always make it in. So I've done it that way, but I've never telecommunicated with another provider in a session. I'd be very curious. I don't know if anyone left in the room has had that experience. Hmm. 
Um, and Veronica notes um, this might be when family doesn't have technology and the staff brings in technology. Yes, you know, um, a lot of the families that I work with will have access to, you know, smartphones or a family plan. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I, I use FaceTime. And again, remember, it's not a supported platform. And some clients don't like having extra apps on their phones, um, but they don't have access to a tablet or laptop. So I think if, if your agency can provide the technology, um, it, it opens more doors for communication and continuity of care. So I think it's a win-win. It's having access to providing those things that I think is the most, um, probably the biggest barrier to service provision. So Brianda asks, do you feel like the human connection is just as strong um, as face-to-face -face therapy when you're online? I think it adds a different level of intimacy. Um, so, you know, residentially, you, you're, there's that live energy that you get it with sitting with someone. But in, there is a screen, there is a keyboard, and there can be distractions. It really forces me to be a better practitioner. My phone is nowhere near me. I can reach my coffee and my water. That's about it. I have to be extremely focused. So that, I think it makes me a better practitioner in some ways. I'm less distracted by noise in the waiting room, the ticking of the clock, the person who always moves furniture on the third floor. Um, and then also seeing someone's face. And I, I mentioned my kitten before. Like I said, I think it makes you a little bit more human. Um, you know, when you sneeze in the middle of session or there's a tech glitch and trying to work it out together. Um, and I think being transparent of if I glitch out, do I call you or do you call me? And you'll see that in the, the contract I shared with today's attendees. Um, so I think you have to, it allows for a certain level of, of humanity. You know, if a client says, I need to pause to run to the restroom, um, it's a different intimacy, but I think it's just as valuable. So speaking of humanity, Nancy asks, what happens if somebody is in a state where you're, residents, you're, where you're licensed to practice, but they go on vacation to another state? Um, that, it depends on the insurance company, but most of those sessions are not covered because they've left. Um, and usually when someone's on vacation, if they're traveling with their family, we'll talk about different ways that they can kind of manage the boundaries um, and to take care of themselves as if they would were to take a vacation from residential. And if someone's in that much crisis that they would want to speak to you while they're away, we would also talk about the practicality of choosing that for vacation. Um, but those aren't always reimbursed. And if someone feels really strongly, then we talk about sliding scale and then private reimbursement. And occasionally I will have a client do that. For my uh, young adults who study abroad, they are often covered under their parents' health insurance. So their home address never changes. Um, or their insurance, um, their university has a sponsored um, travel insurance. Then I sit down with the family and we look at the insurance together to see if the sessions are covered. Um, for study, I see Nancy typing. For study abroad, if it's a young adult who's studying abroad, universities now often ask for additional insurance to cover, um, often if they're attending like a European or Central American university. So we'll look at that policy together. And again, a lot of times families will say, rather than dealing with all the paperwork, can we do a copay while the student is abroad? And I will say yes, and we'll talk about what's feasible. So great questions. All right, so I know you're only available till 2.20, so I'm going to ask one final question, which sure. is a, a good final question, actually. So Emmanuel asks, how do you view the future application of telehealth? And he asks in particular for domestic violence or for international social work, but I'm actually curious to hear what you think about the future in general. You know, I think it's, it's the wave of the future. I think it really does allow for accessibility. I think it brings up complicated questions. Um, you know, in terms of domestic violence, we really have to be mindful of our client's safety. You know, are they in a safe place? If they're in crisis, how can we best support them? You know, what, what is their standpoint? And so I think we have to be mindful of safety first. We have to be mindful of where our client is at first. Same thing with international social work. I think that it can really deepen our conversations. We have people participating from abroad today, which is so exciting. But the technology does have to be there. There does have to be the bandwidth to support a clear connection 
and not having interrupted service. So I think we need to make sure the technology keeps up with our roots of social work practice. You know, the basic values and principles that are laid out about being where the client is at, you know, being, you know, ethical, um, keeping our client's safety in mind. But I think it can, can really take us even further and, and at the end of the day, decrease barriers to service, which we all want. Mm -hmm. So that actually leads me to plug our next event again, which is global, globally focused. So um, that's Wednesday, February 15th from 1 to 2. And if you're on our mailing list, then um, you'll get information about it. Or if you sent in your email here in the chat, we will add you to our mailing list, and then you will get information about it. Um, and I also want to point out that Professor Councilman Carpenter has shared some further readings. I don't know if you want to say anything about these. Um, there, I recommend for any of you who are interested in doing research, you might be doing your, you know, master's thesis on them, or if you're thinking of what you want to research in social work school, um, this is just some some great kind of user-friendly articles to talk about what's happening behind the scenes that's giving us the evidence we need to be reimbursed for the, the services we provide. So they were very helpful to me, both as student and as practitioner. So I'm happy to share them with you. And if any of you have any questions about my um, internet-based research, you can always find me through the resources and um, through CSSW. So. Um, it was lovely to meet all of you today, and I want to thank the team that invited me to discuss this, and um, please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, so Atiyah. Thank you. We're going to close the event and just want to say big thanks, and we will reassure you that, yes, we will send out um, the readings because we're sending out the slides. So lots of thanks coming in. Very nice. Thanks, everybody.